and Jonathan, please keep an eye on the people coming in. <laughs> so just, just to start again, I'm Christine Nightingale, Associate Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health, and Jonathan, who did just introduce himself, is the Professional Lead for Learning Disability Nursing at the Royal College of Nursing. Let's see if I can move that on. So just as I've just mentioned, we are recording this webinar and I uh, have got the captions on. I hope that's not too distracting, but I um, also hope that increases the accessibility of this session. Um, so we are talking about world events. We are talking about some distressing events as well, uh, um, by virtue of the fact that this these set of seminars started from our concern about what was going on in Ukraine. So then, then it may feel upsetting, it may feel traumatic. Um, we're not explicitly looking at trauma, but uh, there will be some images um, that will reflect on what's been going on in areas of conflict. So I, I just feel that I need to, to, to warn you about that. Oops, that moved on too quickly. So if you know if you feel triggered by a trauma, you know please do not feel that you've got to stay in the webinar. It is being recorded, and you can come back to it at another time and and watch what you want to watch in the webinar. And of course, you know please um, access your normal um, sources of professional support. Uh, we will be talking about issues which may trigger also um, concerns about safeguarding for vulnerable people and please make yourself aware of your local policies for safeguarding if you if you feel that there is a concern that you would like to raise um, in, on reflection after this seminar. We are having a humanitarian conversation. Uh, we, we're, we're not encouraging any blame taking or blame making um, or and we, we obviously will have zero tolerance of any hate speech um, when when we're talking about really really sensitive issues and world conflict our, our role um, from the point of view of this seminar is to see how we can best support um, um, and empower people and that's that's our focus for today as um, healthcare social care professionals working in the field so just just to recap, uh, in March we ran a seminar on specifically looking at Ukraine, and we had we were very fortunate that we had a guest presenter, um, a mother um, who had an adult child with autism and a learning disability, who came onto camera live from Ukraine and talked about the situation there. Those recordings are still available um, if you missed it first time. Um, they really helped us understand, well not even understand, but get a picture of what was going on for people. So following that seminar, Jonathan and I felt that we would like to bring the subject nearer to home and to think about um, people with learning disabilities, autism, intellectual disabilities who may be exposed to world events, distressing events on the TV, social media, people chatting about it and what can we what can we all do to empower and to support uh, people who may be absorbing some of this information and not quite sure really what to do with it so that's where this particular seminar has come from today so let me move on so the outline agenda is that obviously we're, we're looking at the welcome and introductions so welcome everybody um, I've just mentioned how we got to this particular seminar and the rest of the agenda we've got until 1.30 um, so we've allowed ourselves plenty of time if, if any of these conversations uh, take a little bit longer but the outline agenda is that we will have um, a, a discussion about self-advocacy and then we'll move on to building and using nonverbal picture resources. I'm going to just move out the line of the picture uh, to explain distressing, distressing and current affairs. And that's from Books Beyond Words. So they've sent us a video. They're not able to be with us today. And then my, our colleagues from Respond will be talking about trauma informed support. And then we will really open the chat to you um, to, you know, to, to reflect on um, what you've learned and ask some questions of our speakers. So I hope that's all right with everybody. 
and um, what I'm going to do is now stop presenting and I'm going to hand over to to Gary and Ben if you may and if you'd like to introduce yourselves I think would be the best way. Uh, hello everyone um, I'm Gary Borley um, the, I'm the co-founder of the Learning Disability England and before this I founded People First um, since 1984 and, and I brought that over from the United States. Um, People First is a self-advocacy organisation um, Learning Disability England has been going for at least about six years and I'm the membership engagement lead um, at Learning Disability England and um, it's to bring to bring self-advocates, families and providers together to work together like a co-production co and I've been a self-advocate for over about 30 years and I've been done numerous other things, various big conferences uh, around the world. Next slide please. Um, people are worried and wanted to, to better understand what is happening. Um, many people with learned disabilities are worried about people in Ukraine especially with people with learning disabilities and autism. Um, a lot of people are still in big um, institutions in, in Ukraine and we, we a lot of us fear and are worried about what's going to happen to people with learned disabilities. There isn't much accessible information available about the situation out there. Um, so so we rely on what's on the on the news a lot and in the newspapers um people want to to be, to be better informed with with accessible um up to date information um the we get a lot of good information from say in, inclusion europe about what's happening and there has been um, um, like some organizations like Men Mencap have actually put on information. Some, some accessible information that is available is like Easy Read, Easy News at United Response. They produce um, this in an Easy Read story about the war and how other countries have respond. And you can find a lot of that, this on the story here with the www.unitedresponse.org.uk. And here is what uh, Mencap have done. Um, they did an easy read document about what's been happening in Ukraine. And and here they all are. And Sally Hurst um, also shared this easy read on Facebook and helps to explain what is happening and ideas or things that people can do if they feel anxious. And you can find that on easy read. Um, now, but I. Ben will, will share more about um, also about what happened with, with what with my life, my choice, and have they because they've also made easy read documents. And how can people be better informed? Well, a regular up to date information should be available for everyone with a learning disability and um, in different formats maybe in uh, not in just in written format but also audio um so so people who can't read can actually uh, have the information as well if more accessible resources could be made 
this would be really helpful for all of us. You might want to show someone these resources or research together. Do you know of any resources that can that can be shared? Please contact me at info at learning disability England dot org dot UK. Um, how how can you help empower someone with a learning disability to take action? Um, there's quite a few few things on there. You can think about how you can support someone to feel empowered. Maybe in your job role. Can you give suggestions of help or help? Then think about what actions they might take. Do they have a friendship network or a group they could work with? And can, can you start a conversation? People may want to talk about how they feel and needs emotional support. Also remind people um, of their skills and abilities and what can be achieved with these. Next slide, please. Uh, people with learning disabilities want to help. Lots of people with learning disabilities want to contribute to the effort to those to help those in Ukraine. Taking action together can help people feel more positive. People with learning disabilities can help impact on the world. Great action has already taken by some self advocacy groups please people have joined together in so solidarity self advocates taking action me and my pa spoke to philippa and Gillian and their housemates and support them uh, support team about fundraiser they held
Barry, your microphone's muted, sorry. Yes. Thank you ever so much. Um, yes, and I hope you got some ideas from uh, from that from that group. Um, the, I, the only dis downfall they they would have liked is um, the media. They didn't have an, any media that came came to that. They would have loved to have the newspapers and television to come and see what they were doing. Uh, and now um, I would now like to introduce Ben um, uh, McKay, who uh, is a care, care chair of the trustees at My Life, My Choice, to talk about some of the work their members have been doing to support people in the Ukraine. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next slide, please. Hello, my name is Ben McCann, I'm co-chair of the trustees at My Life, My Choice. I've been a co-chair of the trustees now for four years, and I've been a self advocate at My Life, My Choice for five years. Uh, next slide, please. The news about the war in Ukraine made us feel upset at My Life, My, my Choice, and we saw people are helping those with Ukraine, but we weren't sure if the, if those uh, with learning disabilities were actually getting help, getting any help at all. So we decided that we'd do something about it ourselves. Next slide, please. Uh, the Jobs and Money team and I agreed that we should do a fundraiser for Ukraine, and we held one at our Stingray nightclub. Uh, we decided that all entry fees would go to fund, as well as other donations by people made. And it was an excellent night, and we had, uh, I think, we had over a hundred people at, at attend the Stingray nightclub, and people enjoyed their time there. People painted their faces with the Ukrainian flag and posted photos with a large flag. I know I painted my face with the Ukrainian flag and posted and, and posed for the large flag. It was really good fun night, and we raised four hundred pounds. And in inclusion, Europe made sure that the money would go to people with learning disabilities, their carers and their families affected by this horrible war in Ukraine. Next slide, please. We encourage others to do this, do their own phone raises. Or we've come up with some ideas. We could uh, set up a charity button on their Facebook profile, uh, do raffles, um, a sponsored walk, cake and coffee morning sale. Next slide, please. Accessible information. We found that some of our members were worried about what was happening. They worried about how the war could affect them in UK. We ex shared accessible information about Ukraine, including how it might affect us and what we can do to help help as well. We really liked United Res United Response Easy Read, and we shared this with other groups as well. Though, but we do do a lot of our Easy Read uh, work ourselves, especially during the the pandemic and for the U war in Ukraine to inform our members what was happening there. Because it was a very worrying time at the time, because we thought we might end up in the war with them. But I think that's not going to happen so much now, hopefully. So, yes, I think. Um, Keeping everyone informed and especially using easy read is really important. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Gary and Ben. Um, I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, what I wanted to say, Gary, and uh, just thank you for reaching out to me and Chris about this issue. I feel I feel really ignorant saying this, um, but I don't mind admitting my ignorance that um, you know I, I I was aware that I was personally affected by Ukraine and other people affected by Ukraine, and that I could do things about that. So that's why Chris and I decided to do this webinar. It might be why people give food or donations to their, their charity or it might even be whether they do something small like wearing a badge to say that they support Ukraine 
I hadn't thought until you you'd raised it with me. People with learning disabilities are going to be feeling exactly the same. And, and some people might be able to tell you how they're feeling and take action, but other people will be dependent upon us to help them to take action, to do something, because that helps you to deal with that difficult feeling by knowing you can do something about it. So thank you both for, for sharing what you've shared. I think it, it's a really important consideration for us all. How can we empower people to take action? Absolutely. Thank you, Jonathan, for summing that up. And absolutely, I, I agree that uh, in my notes, I've got, you know, the, the amount of resources you've already told us about, Gary, um, the Easy Read versions, um, and, and both of you with the fundraisers, um, you know, supporting uh, charitable events, you know, that, that shows real empowerment and people um, taking control of, you know, making a difference really so uh, this is really important things for us i've put a note in the chat to say um if you would like to put some questions to the speakers we'll take them after all the presentations so please do feel free to start putting any of your questions in the chat now um but thank you again gary and ben and please stay with us um uh, so that we can take your questions uh, toward towards the end because um that's amazing and i can see some things already popping up so I'm going to move on now and look at um, the building and using nonverbal picture resources. Unfortunately, Books Beyond Words couldn't be with us today, but they have sent a, a video presentation. So just bear with me while I put that up on share and we'll we'll run the run the video. If our speakers could put their um, mics on mute as well, please, then we won't get any feedback. So just bear with me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alicia Wood and I'm the Chief Executive of Beyond Words. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about our work that we've done around refugees and refugees with, with learning disabilities. Um, as you, I'm sure you know, we um, have been for more than 30 years uh, producing books uh, aimed at people with learning disabilities and created with people with learning disabilities. We have uh, all sorts of books around um, about feelings, mental health, uh, about health conditions. And we also um, have lots of fun stories, fun stories about love, um, stories about difficult experiences that people have. Um, and and, and what, what's really important about our stories is that they are always told from the perspective of, of people themselves. Um, our, our work is about promoting visual and emotional literacy, so being able to um, understand something through a visual image, um, an artwork, uh, a film is something that we, we all understand. And, and so our, our books, um, whilst they are really good for people who can't read, they are also really good for people who can read, some people that can read a little and are able to understand um, difficult concepts or to start to have a conversation about something through an image. What, what most of our books um, deliberately do is help us think about our feelings. So, so because our stories are often about taboo subjects or, or, or difficult experiences, um, our books always promote uh, conversations and they help people to uh, not only understand what's going on around them, but understand how they feel about it and, and where they are into, in relation to, to things going on around them. So uh, our books are, are uh, not about easy read. Um, we can have one image and five people will see five different things in there. So our books are about people um, looking at images and putting their own stories and feelings um, and thoughts onto what they, they see in that image. 
So I'm going to um, talk a little bit about our um, two books that we have produced um, recently uh, around refugees. And so the first one I'll talk about is is when the war came. And, and, and that's a very short story that we developed really quickly in response to uh, the, the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Um, the, and the other is a refugee story, which we've been developing for over 12 months. We just launched it a couple of weeks ago. Um, we put out an abridged version uh, in the Afghan crisis to um, so, so that people could could have conversations about what what was going on. I think that um, what we know is that um, that the the Ukraine crisis has. Um, has caused um, lots of worry around people. I think probably because it's very close. I think that we we often and naturally um, feel differently about something that's very close to us, um, and and we know that um, there are um, certainly across Europe, um, maybe less so in the UK. There are many refugees with learning disabilities who are going to settle in other countries, and so. This uh, book is very much um, for for them to be able to um, talk about their experience, to have something to be able to tell their story. But also, I think um, importantly is that we've got um, whether they're children with learning disabilities or or not going into environments like like schools, like supported housing, like other families who are hosting. And this is a way that um, people who don't understand what they might, what refugees go through, can start to see a bit of a refugee story. Um, so we've been using them um, already in some of the schools that we work in, where they are receiving refugees or have received refugees in the past, and and we know that um, they they create empathy and understanding. Um, for those of us who um, have had the good fortune not to have to flee their own country. So our images are um, always very real, um, sometimes very difficult. Uh, probably some of the images um, you might not use with someone someone who has is in in the, the midst of trauma because they've just fled their country. Um, sometimes the images um, are are too too difficult for people to process too soon in their their journey. Um, for for refugees um, that have been. Um, living in another country for some time. We, we know through the trialing of our refugee books that that um, we've been able to help refugees that have been in the UK for some time process their feelings around what happened to them by using images. Um, and these were refugees without learning disabilities. And they were able to seek mental health um, support because of that. Um, so, so, so they can be used in all sorts of different ways. And, and one of the important things about our stories is that we always have, have a resolution. So we see in this one um, that a family um, has been un, in an air, under an airstrike and, and that the family have had to leave. Um, the end of, of this story um, is, is um, where a family gets to safety and, and we're currently doing the second half of this story at the moment, so we hopefully we'll be publishing that soon. Um, the book that we launched last week is a, is a full story um, and, and it's, whilst there's no particular country that it's set in, it's very clearly is set in, in the Middle East and, but I think that um, that I, I literally just came out an hour ago from from a, a book group with people with learning disabilities reading the story, and it it, it led directly to talking about um, Ukraine refugees that had come to Britain. So so there were really interesting conversations um, that we were having, and I and I think this is where our books can be really helpful in, in, in bringing empathy. So, so for example, one of the, the book group, he started by saying, oh yeah, we've, we've got refugees close by and they, um, they're, they're, they're moaning about the food that they get. Uh, 
and um, they should just be happy that they're safe. And after reading the story and and seeing what was happening to the refugees and and starting to reflect on how he might feel if he had to go to another country and eat food that was disgusting to him and and totally foreign and 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 what that might feel like and and i think that you know by the end of of the book club the 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 man that that felt that people were asking too much really understood that how he might feel if he was put in the situation of 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 being a refugee and I think that this kind of the, the sort of public discourse around around um, refugees, um, you know, being scroungers, being whatever it is, is 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 really corrosive. And and I think, you know, and I've certainly seen it over the years that that people with learning disabilities are are affected by this discourse. And I think it's really important for to help people understand um, what does happen. You know, the fact that the people um, like this or go a completely ordinary family like anyone else and that they um you know without without um any choice in the matter have had their whole lives turned upside down um i think that that seeing that um people uh, and helping to understand their feelings through through the images really help is a great equalizer and helps people to understand that actually you know no, nobody chooses to to leave their their countries so um that's just a, a brief um run through uh, our resources i think that that probably um the the best way that our resources can be used are in book clubs in groups where you you talk through stories and so so um the important thing is that that people are able to put their own words onto the pictures so so what we do with with a book in a book club is we take start at page one we take each picture at a time and we get each book club member to say what is it that you see in this picture um what's happening what's happening with that man what's happening with that boy what do you think they're feeling how would you feel if that was you and i think those those kind of conversations bring up um so much and and they 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 being open ended questions are are really important it's not about telling someone what's going on though of course that is part of it so um, I'm, I'm just going to um, finish by um, giving you some information about where you might buy the books that um, the refugee books, the, the um, When the War Came is just a free download. Um, so you can get that off our website and um, the refugee story is newly available um, since last week and you, you can order that. Um, we'd really like to hear from people who want to be having these conversations with people with learning disabilities and who are interested in in setting up a book club um, we're also working in schools with children so if you are aware of of schools or you're part of a school that wants to be having these conversations with children um, do, do do talk to us if you're a mental health practitioner who's working with people with learning disabilities or with refugees, um, we've we've got some resources that can help you um, use the stories to to bring about important conversations and and healing, um, and and we provide training in that as well. So I just want to say thanks very much for your time. I'm sorry that I couldn't be here today, and hope this um, recording isn't too clunky. Thanks. Bye bye. That was brilliant to see, wasn't it? I, um, I think, Gary, when you shared earlier some of the easy read information that say they, you made a really important point that sometimes easy read information isn't easy for everyone. And we need to think of other types of um, information that say there'd be audio or different visual and books beyond words 
is a really good example where you don't need words you're just showing pictures and you're opening up a conversation and it's conversations that are important to everyone and everyone includes people with learning disabilities and by using something like that we can get those conversations started to make sure people can have conversations that they really want to have absolutely jonathan I entirely agree and it has been a lovely connection so thank you very much alicia for for your presentation i hope you get to see the whole conference um, but it, the, the, there's a lovely flow isn't there of that sort of how do we provide information in different formats um, for, for people to engage with in, in ways that they feel best and I thought you know some of those pictures were hugely powerful um, it really sent a knot in my stomach actually you know the power of those pictures um, and, and also, I think we've learned about some other methodologies as well, you know, like the book groups, the discussion groups, you know, that's a fabulous way of, um, you know, encouraging people to say, what are they seeing in those pictures? And, and maybe being able to um, put a little bit more information on, onto, those, onto those images as well. So uh, thank you again, Alicia. Um, and as I said, please put any questions or comments in, in the chat and we will come to that. But I really would like to move on now um, to for our last guest speaker, um, who's Lynn, Lynn Toes. I, I think that's, how, sorry, apologies if I pronounce your name co incorrectly, who's the Advocacy Services Manager at Respond. Uh, Respond offices advocacy and therapy to people who are autistic or have a learning disability. The advocacy team offers trauma-informed emotional support face-to-face -face and online and also offers group support online. The emotional support is often more relevant for clients and covers a variety of subjects, all of which the advocates approach as creatively as possible. So really, again, very much looking forward to what you've got to say, Lynn. Um, and, and, you know, this just adds to our, our skill box, if you like, of, of what's out there for us all to tap into. So over to you. OK, thank you very much. Well, that, I think that's a hard act to follow so far, actually. So I'm hopefully, um, yeah, I'm hopeful that I've uh, pitched it kind of correctly, but I'm not sure. It's such a such a large topic, actually, and it's really, really fantastic that we're beginning to talk about these things. So um, I'm going to just share this PowerPoint, if I can. And if you can let me know if you can see that, Christine, can you? Not yet, no. OK, um, let me have another go then. Ah, that might be better. Can you see that now? Yes, I think you can, yes. can't you? Yes. OK, fantastic. Well, let me introduce you, first of all, to June and Sanjay. They form part of our Respond Action Group and I'm I'm privileged to be a co-facilitator of that group. Um, so that's who I am. Um, let me move on because I don't think we've got that much time actually for how many slides I've got. So um, respond, who are we? We're Sorry, Lynn, a, a you're absolutely fine. You know, do your have got time. Yes, OK, OK, fine. cool. So um, Respond is a small national, well, medium sized national charity now, um, provides support for children and adults with a learning disability. Um, children and adults who are autistic um, and have experienced trauma, abuse or loss. So we have several different services. Um, the therapy services are really the survivors, young people, forensic um, and family support services. We have um, other services that I'm not going to go into detail with, but if anybody has any questions afterwards about it, they, they can certainly ask me about those. Excuse me. So. Um, but all of the services outside the therapeutic services are trauma informed and that's really quite key. Um, before I, I go on to this next slide, I'll put the slide up actually because this is our model. We believe that the trauma sits in the middle of these three circles, as you can see, which represent abuse, loss and disability. And um, one of the things that comes up for us actually is something called the three secrets. Now, I don't actually know who termed that phrase, but what they, they talk about in our therapy services is that uh, people don't like to talk about sex, disability or death with people 
with a learning disability or with autistic people and it becomes taboo subjects. So, um, and to kind of, when I was thinking about today, I thought about COVID and how that impacted so many people. And one of the things that I found through COVID was how proactive people with a learning disability were actually, and autistic people. Um, I called an autistic woman who said that for her it leveled out the playing field. She was no, she was usually isolated and used to it, but then everybody else was. So she felt that she had more um, ability or she had more opportunity to talk about how it affected her. So I really want to to kind of highlight the assumptions that and expectations that get in the way of uh, of the lives of people with a learning disability. This is what I've experienced. Um, and how people stop, yeah, people stop um, the people that we support from doing things, from having their opinions because they're, they're concerned about them. Um, and this actually adds to this here, the three secrets, but it also adds to this, um, this model that Respond has about how trauma sits with all of those things, but actually we, we can add to that. Um, I hope this is going to be relevant as I continue through, actually. So um, one of the other things through COVID, which I found, was that I, I attended quite a few self-advocacy groups. And what I found was that the people in those advocacy groups were far more sensible than the government was at the time. And it was a real key, key point, actually, that um, people with a learning disability had a completely different take sometimes on the world. But actually, it was really interesting and, and obviously really valuable and made more sense. So um, I'm going to just talk a bit with these slides about trauma, because I think it's really important to remember what trauma is, because we can sometimes forget that in, in our daily lives. Um, and so this is what trauma is. This is what we believe trauma is at Respond. It's an emotional shock that someone experiences following an event that involves actual or perceived threat to one's physical or mental well-being. Trauma can also occur in response to witnessing or hearing about a similarly terrible event involving someone else. And I've highlighted that because that can also be called secondary trauma. It's not happening to you, but you can either hear that it's happened to somebody else or that you can see it's happened to somebody else. So for the event to be traumatic, the person's response must involve intense fear, helplessness or horror and must overwhelm the normal coping mechanisms. The shock from experiencing a traumatic event can have a physiological as well as a psychological impact. So that means that it can, um, you know, you can actually see people shaking sometimes when they've they've heard bad news or they've seen something on the TV. So that's that's the physiological uh, effect of of what they've seen. And for the body, it's almost well, it is actually as if it's happening to that person. That's the key thing here, is that hearing something or seeing something, the effect can go into the body and it can be experienced by the body. At that point, maybe the brain isn't thinking about why um, that effect has, has manifested, it just is. So with unprocessed trauma, so if the response does not lead to a, a point of safety, it remains undigested or unprocessed. And this is one of the key things, I think, when we're talking about, I, I was thinking specifically if people hear or see things on the news um, just suddenly out of the blue, you know, what they do with all of that, how they feel about that. Can they actually verbalise what they've seen? Um, and if they can't, then, it, you know, it, it become really, really difficult and it will manifest in other areas of their life. So it will come out in other different areas and it can also become complex post-traumatic stress disorder um, or post-traumatic stress disorder if they don't have the opportunity to talk about it um, and express how they feel about it. So how do how do these trauma responses manifest? How do they come out? Well the situation is perceived as being a matter of survival so the person's reaction has to be quick and therefore happens unconsciously. So in these responses, as I'm sure people are aware, can be fight, flight, freeze or flop. And it's always good, I think, to think about the people that we work with and the reactions that they have sometimes that we don't um, maybe understand or we're not sure where the responses have come from. Sorry, I flipped through too quickly there. 
And some of these symptoms might be feeling sad and hopeless, experiencing guilt and shame, withdrawing, going numb, um, feeling anxious, they might have difficulty concentrating, different mood swings, nightmares, not being able to go to sleep, waking up in the middle of the night, physical symptoms, fatigue. Sorry, these have got a bit mixed up here, haven't they? Aches and pains and um, stomach problems. So intestinal distress over stomach problems, maybe problems with bowels, all sorts of different things. And these can be the symptoms of having been traumatized. And sometimes these happen without us even being aware that they're happening. That's that's really, I think, one of the important points when we're talking about people being exposed to distressing news. However that comes to them, whether they hear, overhear people talking about it, whether they see, as I said, something on TV or they hear it on the radio. And actually sometimes it, um, it doesn't have to be an image, it can be a noise. You know, there can be lots of distressing noise on the internet, um, which just go in without us actually really consciously being able to say, hold on, I don't really want to to hear that because it's already happened. So, you know, some of these symptoms, they 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 come about and maybe we don't really understand where why we're suddenly feeling all those different things. So this is um, Golding's Pyramid. And the reason I put this in here actually is because um, it's probably key if you're thinking about how you want to support somebody that you think is traumatized or is exhibiting or showing signs of being traumatized. And um, it's a bit like if anyone's familiar with Maslow's hierarchy as well, actually. But one of these things on the bottom is feeling safe um, physically and emotionally. And then the next rung, the next step on the ladder is developing relationships. And after that, we have comfort, care in relationships. Following from that, we have empathy and reflection. And it's not very good at the top, actually, but what it says is resilience and reflection. And then um, you can explore the trauma and then maybe mourn or grieve the loss or, or um, express those difficult feelings. So it's really kind of, I suppose what I'm trying to do here is to is, is invite us really to think about what it is that we need to put in place for people. You know, and the, and the books, without words is, is one of the excellent ways for people to be able to 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 look at maybe how they feel about things or feel about or how they've been impacted by their own experiences. But also, I think that um, if you don't have that to hand, then you need to think about how you can actually manage um, your own reactions, but also support the person who is uh, feeling very distressed or is traumatized at that point. Um, so how can trauma be, being trauma informed make a difference? Well, it's less likely to re-traumatize the person. The consistency in our approach is stabilizing and containing. And I think one of the examples of that might be actually to just sometimes quite simply acknowledge that what has been um, heard or seen or spoken about can be really, really distressing. You know, just open up a conversation with somebody really about um, oh, how did you feel about that? You know, oh, that 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 was quite difficult to hear for me. How how did you feel? And whatever, I, you know, it will ultimately depend on the relationship that you have with that person. But certainly, um, opening up conversations is go is going to be key. Um, we can sometimes help people because become aware when they are feeling traumatized um, or they're having a traumatic response and help them manage this. Um, and also, that's not popes, that's people I think it's supposed to be. These aren't all my slides, actually. Invite people to talk about issues. Um, and for me, I think one of the most important things is knowing that remain, remaining silent is not always a best interest for people. You know, I've come across many situations where people don't really, particularly when I've worked with the, the police or um, different statutory agencies, People don't always think that they should bring a subject up because they don't want to upset someone and they think it's in that person's best interest. Well, um, 
I think it's always about timing, if I'm honest. Maybe it's not the right time to bring something up, but also um, it's not a good thing to leave things be either. It's not good for the person for things to be left because they still end up with all that unprocessed trauma. OK, so um, what can we do? And one of the things I was hoping people would do is put their ideas in the in the chat. You know, I think it's um, it might be it. There isn't a one size fits all. Nobody has a complete solution or all of the answers. But um, I was thinking that together, you know, people can come up with ideas all the time. And we've we've all witnessed that, particularly through COVID more recently, I think. Um, so, and what can we all do? Well, there is no magic wand. Working in the context of trauma will always be messy and situations don't always go as planned. But trauma trained staff can gain a greater awareness and therefore better equipped to respond rather than just react to people. So being trauma informed, thinking in terms of, of trauma and how it might impact the people we support. Um, and also what I wanted to, 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 to bring in actually is to mention two people who were part of the action group who were in our women's group. And the, um, they recently did some work for us because they're as part of an experts by experience training. And these are the things that they came up with. And I think it's really all, you know, I can't emphasize enough actually how often come come across people who don't really do any of this and actually are quite quite more interested in maybe tick boxes or not taking people's views into consideration. So they came up with these points. Don't talk behind our backs. Don't interrupt or talk over us. Don't judge us. Don't ignore us. Don't ignore our questions. Don't push by us. Don't talk too quickly. And don't try to get us to do something we don't want to do. And then they came up with these five points. And um, I'll read them. Being genuine, non-judgmental, don't bully, be understanding, be honest and trustworthy. Now, these were their words. And um, the thing that struck me about them was that if anybody's aware of Carl Rogers and his his approach to person-centered counseling or person-centered support is pretty much the same as that actually and um and yet they didn't have to to <laughs> that came quite naturally for them to say those things so i'm just going to come off actually um yeah i want i wanted also i'm just looking at my notes actually because it was such a massive subject and i thought what what would be most useful and i think that one of the things that we have to remember is that trauma can manifest as stress, anxiety, fear, mood swings, sadness, self-harm, and it can manifest also in physical problems, illnesses, behaviour. Um, but how often do people with a learning disability or autistic people have the opportunity to talk about those things? It was over 30 years ago, people wouldn't have thought that people with a learning disability could have actually um, benefit, benefited at all from um, therapy, but yeah, at Respond, we know that they can and that they do. So things are changing all the time. And, I, and again, I'll go back to my point about COVID actually, and that people came together and were able to be really clear um, about how ridiculous some of the, the rules were and, and the points that they were, be, were being made. So I think now it, it's we're at a point of transition where we need to to come up with some some a better way actually of opening up opportunity for people with a learning disability to talk about the world, the stresses, the the things that they hear, you know. So um, I think that's about it for me. I feel like on one level I'm going to come off stop sharing if I can. Have I stopped sharing? Did that stop sharing? No, you're still sharing. Am I still sharing? OK, right, let me come off them. There you go. All right, brilliant. Um, so I feel I've gone all over the place a bit with this, actually, but it's just it feels quite massive on one level to try and get as much information as possible. So I apologise if I've rambled. But I think that I come across 
people that I support, I come across their um, the expe expectations of other people so often in their support network that hinders what they are able and want to do. You know, and, and there's a thing in life coaching, if anybody's familiar with it, called limiting beliefs. And actually, the limiting beliefs means that we, we think we can't do something because of our experiences, because what people say to us. And I think this applies all the time alongside best interests to people with a learning disability, that actually we stop them experiencing um, life before they've even thought that they could. I mean, it's quite it's really not good enough, really, to be quite honest. So. Um, yeah, that's my thoughts so far. And oh, the other thing that I wanted to mention was I was a conf at a conference recently and somebody was talking about a piece of work another person had done, and I don't remember the names, but she mentioned casual oppression. And for me, that really stuck with me. The casual oppression of, of people with a learning disability or autistic people, the people that I, I support every day. And it, it happens in many, many different ways and it seeps in. Sometimes you it seeps in before you realised it has. So opening up the conversation, but in a safe way, in a way that, you know, people can feel confident supporting people, you know, is um, is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. I think you could probably talk about this all day. It is a massive yeah. topic it, and it's got so many different angles and complexities to it. I was thinking as you were talking about um, an autistic man with severe learning disabilities I used to speak, used to support, and how whenever you said the word no, effectively he'd be traumatised by hearing the yeah. word no, and it would create that sort of sense of trauma in him. Um, and that, um, was it Goldring's pyramid? Um, it, yeah. That, that, just thinking about you know first we've got to help them to feel safe with us we've got to build that rapport um and thinking of it from a from a, a traumatic uh, perspective is really helpful but i thinking of it as a, an equal human being perspective isn't it really at the end of the day that if i was in that situation i'd need to feel safe with you before i can talk about yeah. this i'd need to have that relationship so no thank you it's been really really helpful the other thing I wanted to just mention, actually, was about environments. You know, we have to be kind of really, I think, um, we have to consider the environments. You know, there are there are places I know where people are living and the TV's on all the time. And actually, you know, what is coming out of the TV and what might be upsetting and then may manifest two hours later when someone's really upset and there's no connection between those things. You know, that kind of because, I mean, if you think about if as an adult you go into a situation and you know that people um there's an argument going on you kind of pick up on that don't you You feel it you feel an effect from it you know children in domestic violence situations they understand what's going on even if people aren't speaking to them you know um so all through our lives we're, we're picking up on all different kind of feelings so there's no reason why we we, we shouldn't be able to acknowledge that now for for people with a learning disability, for autistic people, that actually we may not understand why they're behaving in a certain way now, but maybe two hours ago they were affected by something and we actually weren't paying attention, you know, so yeah. Absolutely, and I think that's where we came to for this particular discussion was that we were very aware that, you know, people are exposed to um, uh, environmental factors uh, and news and all those sorts of things and, you know, you know, what do we do um, to identify that trauma and that support? And I think you've given us such a wonderful um, breadth of underpinning theory, really. And, you know, I've certainly written down lots of notes. And one of the things, and I'm, I'm surprised Jonathan didn't say it because it's something you often say, is, is thinking about that diagnostic overshadowing as well. That, you know, when you talked about that list of physical symptoms and psychological symptoms, that, you know, somebody who may not be able to articulate exactly what's going on, but, you know, their behaviour changes and someone may just say, oh, that's how they always are, instead yeah. of actually saying, um, do you know what was on the news? Do you know that somebody was having a fight in the corridor a minute yeah. ago? And, you know, not being able to identify that. So I think, you know, that that brought all those sorts of things home to me. And I really liked the... Um, 
the thought about you know being an authentic person you know to be yourself mm -hmm. and I've certainly got some questions arising from that but first of all I'd like to say thank you so much Lynn that really topped you know uh, the the conversations off beautifully with um, the the wonderful presentations from Gary and Ben and Alicia's um, information about other resources so you know that tied it together and I really would like to invite people to put anything in the chat and I'm sure Jonathan and I can come up with some questions um, so Jonathan have you seen any questions in the chat at the moment no one has posted any questions in there at the moment um, I don't know if you wanted to turn on the opportunity for people to join with I, I don't know how teams work sorry but um, if you wanted to you could put the opportunity for people to phrase or someone phrase their hand there wherever they could have their mics on so I've got a question from Louise in the chat now on it just saying thank you okay um, no, I've seen some lovely comments coming supporting what's been what's been said uh uh Gillian um let me see oh, I'm going to put the mic on for you hello Gillian Hello, everybody. It's been a really in impressive meeting again. I mean, amazing stuff that's coming out. Um, I, I just put in the chat about the therapeutic cup of tea. Um, here we are. Let's put the camera on as well. Can you see me? The cup of tea. Um, I've been a community learning disability nurse and worked in um, residential um, services as well for a long time. Um, and what I always valued was that opportunity, what I call that therapeutic cup of tea, which is a really important part of a toolkit for anybody supporting people with a learned disability. It could be another drink, but call it cup of tea for the sake of it. And I remember colleagues around me who weren't regularly working with people learned disability used to comment about how many cups of tea could you possibly drink? You seem to be spending so much time drinking tea. But that's because we were having a conversation and I think that's been a big part of what's come out today and certainly my recollections around my time working in residential services is we knew when the news was coming on and it was really important when the news is on the television to sit down with people in the living room if they want to be in the living room with that cup of tea and talk about what you're seeing um, talk about what's on the soaps that people are watching and it was a real big part of the day and I absolutely worked my hardest to have the turn off the television if you're listening to the radio and vice versa and I think those kinds of environmental changes are really really powerful um, and the other space for me with the cup of tea was as a community nurse people had the choice of whether they wanted to chat with me at home or we'd chat in the local coffee shop and again we'd have this space where we could feel safe to talk there were often free newspapers in the coffee shop so that would be our space to sit down have a look and see what's going on so I spent an awful lot of time in those places drinking cups of tea but it was really important part of my relationship with that person I was working with but again you know for them this opportunity to unload and talk about what's going on about the world around them it isn't for me always about working out what the reason for the referral was in the first place because there's so much stuff going on in that person's life that you aren't going to work out what's happening in the referral until you've given people the chance to talk about all the other things that they're worrying about so yeah my vote always goes for the therapeutic cup of tea so have that in your toolkit um, and keep using it and it's really important to have time to talk over a cup of tea Thank you Thank so you. much, Liam. I think it's important to have that conversation in whatever way the person wants to communicate as well. So some people may not use words, they might use behaviours. And Liam, I think it was on your second or third slide where you were talking about what is trauma. And you mentioned uh, normal coping mechanisms. And that got me thinking about what's normal for me might not be normal for you. And it might be that some people with learning disabilities might be presenting what we might consider abnormal coping mechanisms. And that could be hand flapping and spinning and things like that. Or it could be something completely different. But if it's their way of coping, we've got to help them to have that way and, and, and to, get to use that process. Um, but also, I suppose that people with a disability in learning may not learn coping skills in the same way that we do, but we might have to support people to learn those coping skills as well. Can I, can yeah. I have a question for Gary and Ben as well? Um, the, you, you, you 
articulated a lot about empowering people and the sort of groups that you're involved in. How can we help make that happen more across the country? Um, you know, what what's the toolkit we need to to support people to have those empowering conversations and the advocacy work, which has obviously resulted in, you know, two great examples that you've shared with us today. Um, do you want to say something, Ben? Uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, wow. It's about uh, people learning disabilities, uh, starting having agreements like Gary started uh, uh, People mm. First and did Learning Disability England. And I could say the same about our president, uh, Michael Edwards. So he started at My Life, My Choice 22 years ago because he didn't feel like he was being heard as a person with learning disability. And it's gone on from there. We've just gone from strength to strength and strength, uh, word by math, but we've got. Uh, uh, got an extra 50 members this year alone so far though but the disability groups are re really important and uh, we do actually lots of uh, campaigning work through the groups and also education groups like um, healthy diets, sex and relationships but also we're working on, on um, things that affect our groups uh, locally like in Banbury where I live though the, we, we've got concerns about the, how the police force treat people with learning disability. And actually, I was in a meeting yesterday, and we I was talking to the superintendent for uh, Neathrop, no, not Neathrop, uh, Chairwell and uh, West Oxfordshire. And that, the only reason we managed to get this chat was because I went to the uh, the Christchurch um, church service for the Queen's Jubilee and actually met her there. So it was a good bit of networking on my part that we managed to get to speak to the person, and we're building a relationship with the person. Hopefully, she will come to my BAM group and reassure. Her our members that things have been done because there actually is no a person there's no uh, uh disability lanes on person in oxygen at the moment the last person we had has left and we're waiting for a replacement but they only they had to, it was one person that had to cover the whole of oxygen you think how big oxygen is it's, they should have one in every town really thank you for, for me for me i i would like to see more self-advocacy groups but mm -hmm. to do that and we need more funding um but a lot of groups used to rely on local local authority funding in the past but we need to make sure that uh, um, self-advocacy is more self-efficient and hopefully also creating jobs for people with learning disabilities uh, in the organization and having also um, the support um, like from P having PAs, I have a PA myself in, in, in Learning Disability England and and I'm happy to be working and you know earning a living and um, it'd be great to see more, pe more people. We are got less than six percent of people in, in employment at the moment. Mm -hmm. We need to grow that a lot more if every business and every self-advocacy group can employ each six percent, we then we got on the on the way of getting um, a good self-advocacy, and we need to encourage colleges and universities to take on people with learning disabilities as students as well, um, because instead of going into is straight in from from a special school into a day centre. They can go into a college and earn a earn a sort of course and 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 earn grades and and all that to, to, to happening. You said something in the chat, Gary. We are stronger together, uh, and I think that is so important. And I think it's how do we connect people with learning disabilities with people with similar interests and strengths and needs. And how do we, like, we talk a lot about other forms of diversity, like um, the Women's Euros is on at the moment, and that's never yeah. been on telly before, but that gives females a real positive role models of things that they can do in their future. Yes. And we need to do the same for people with learning disabilities. So people like, yep. like yourself um, and, oh, what's the name of the man that works at NHS England, um, Mayor of Selby. I forgot his name now, um, but Gavin. People, it was it Gavin? 
That's it. Yeah, Gavin. Yeah, Gavin is a great example of a good self advocate. Yeah, and I think it, it's having people like that that people with learning disabilities can look at and go, well, if if he can do that, I can do that, and that giving people that confidence. So we've got things to learn from other um, disadvantaged groups, perhaps, or underrepresented groups. Well, we used to we used to have sorry we used to have national and international people first conferences, but we don't seem to have that so much now. And a lot of those people were role mo models for other people. Yeah, definitely. Uh, my life, my choice has a women's group, and I think every society group uh, should have a women's group. And also, I'm um, speaking to people over the world with our international psychology group uh, created by Donna Callahan in Boston, Massachusetts. And it's mainly people from America and England, but we have got people, somebody from Scotland and a couple of people from Ireland, uh, a couple of people from Australia. We've got somebody from Canada as well. And we're trying to get people from uh, South Africa and uh, New Zealand. We're trying to get everybody who speaks English first. And then we concentrate on the more difficult countries that don't speak English. And I think bringing it back to the theme of today, you know, if if you can speak to someone who's like you, that's going through what you're going through, then that sort of validates what you're going through in some ways. So, you know, if if you meet someone having a cup of coffee um, and you go in, oh, I saw this on the news and it made me feel really upset. Yeah, you know, oh, I'm glad you said that because I felt really upset too, and I didn't know if I could talk about it. So. I think that again, that's where self advocacy and having peer support is is really important. You know, I was I, just thinking how. Sorry, Gary. I was just thinking. Go on, sorry. It's, go, you go. Thank you. I was just thinking how great it would be to have like a news um, program that was run by people with a, um, a learning disability. You know, mm -hmm. so that um, that could be that could be translated to put subtitles on it and just have like a weekly news. What's the word? Update. You know, that would be really, but it's about funding. Who mentioned, I think Gary, you mentioned funding, did you? Yeah, I mentioned yeah. funding. I was just going to say, I was um, a co-presenter for the BBC years ago. Mm. Yeah, that was. Um, well, that's you then, isn't it? <laughs> and, and then I, I did a reporting for the Link programme. Cool. So I've done that and I always wanted to get back on working on television maybe doing a chat show or something like that well let's hope that when we publish this um this uh this event today that someone will with the money and with the connections will pick up on some of these ideas because i think you know that that really increases that um self-advocacy and um translation of events in in a much more accessible way doesn't it so um so i think we we really got some um great ideas about that self-advocacy and I assume that people if they're interested in their areas of encouraging people to create self-advocacy groups they can contact you Gary and Ben to discuss that yeah. through, through your yes. web links thank you I, I've got a question just to pick up on Lynn as well I, I was just thinking of myself as a health professional uh, as well you know you know, I, I find the whole notion of that trauma informed support really, really powerful and important. But where would I start? Where would we encourage people to to feel confident and what do they need to find out and learn? Um, well, like that, I mean, I suppose the, the obvious question is to see if there's any training that you could kind of go on. But there is a lot of information on the Internet about trauma and symptoms and um, impact. You know, and I think that um, so in terms of self-learning, find out really what, you know, a bit more about the, the symptoms, what causes it and what what you can do, what kind of questions you can ask or um, how you can approach someone. And again, it comes down to, to rapport, doesn't it, and relationships with people. And I think that that cup, of, the cup of tea um, is a great example. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I remember when I was um, a key worker, mm -hmm. And we'd have, the structure was that you'd have a key work session and no one ever said anything in the key work session. It was almost like, oh, no, well, why have we got to come here and sit, you know, talk about this outside of those sessions? People would, you know, always talk, sit down, have a chat, you know, and it's so it's. 
it's I think it's one of the, the important things is to know when to um, well, no, not to stop something happening, really. That's what I mean by that. So if somebody's about to talk, but it's maybe not what you were expecting or you're supposed to do something else, then you have to kind of dismiss all of that stuff and just sit and listen. And it's not, I think people get put off and get a bit frightened, but actually sometimes it's not rocket science, is it? If it's a cup of tea, sitting yeah. down, having a cup of tea and listening to someone. Because ultimately for me, and this is my personal opinion, one of the, the biggest enemies if you like to re-traumatization is being isolated and being silenced if you're isolated you sit with that all the time you know there's no one to say anything and, and when when you have shared with someone and someone's gone i'm really sorry to hear that you know what do you think you we could do to support you or what are you going to do now you know um what can we put in place or what do you want to do whatever it might be however the conversation goes then that person's going to go away knowing that they're not on their own with that you know they're no longer isolated because they've shared it and and hopefully they've had a a really positive response they've had an empathic response and that's going to like minimize the issue not not take it away but minimize that issue of of being isolated and also means that you don't have to be silent because you've had a response from someone that tells you you don't have to be silent about this you know they they i can't again just the last thing I want to say is for me, they are the most important things because being isolated and not allowed to speak, where does that go? It just just bubbles up, ruminates and puts you in a really, really unhappy place. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So and, sure and I answered your things, question. No, that, that's, that's really clear. And, you know, the things I will take away personally is, you know, those sort of models, the, the Golding's uh, Pyramid and and that, you know, that you really um, made it very, you reiterated that sort of active listening sort of skill, yeah. which, um, you know, are central to so much that we we all do, uh, regardless of our role and, and position. John, Can I just uh, say, Christine, just one last thing is sometimes we get in the way. You know, we ourselves with all of our I must is this safeguarding? Must I do this? Should I do that? What am I going to say to that? All of these other things get in the way instead of, as you say, just that active listening. Just listen, you know. Yeah, that's Thank all. You. I'll Thank put my mic on now. Uh, I'm, re I'm really aware that we're into our last five minutes. Um, uh, I don't think I've seen any other chats, but lovely comments in 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 the chat. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Is there anything you want to say uh, reflectively to to sum up at all? Uh, I I mean, what what another amazing event! I think this is the second one of these that we've done, and they've both been incredibly powerful. Um, I think Gary's coming in the chat. We are stronger together. Sums it up basically. You know, we couldn't do this without Gary, Ben, Lynn and Alicia Shone. And I need to give a nod to um, Sam Clark as well in the background, who has been instrumental from Learning Disability England in, in helping uh, Gary and Ben be here today. Um, so, you know, I, I think we, we, they, we if by getting together like this, we, we're sharing all the, all the really important stuff there. And it's stuff that, you know, even as myself with 20 years experience, sometimes I just don't think Right, and it's only by working together and, and think, talking things through like this that we, we cover all those different angles. So I'm just really, really appreciative and uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you. Thank you so much and, and beautifully summed up. Thank you, uh, Gary. And I'd just like to say thank you to people who joined us today and to people who watch this, um, this um, seminar subsequently. Um, uh, you know, we hope you get as much from it as, as we certainly have today. And I would really, really like to say thank you to our presenters, to Gary, to Ben, to Lynn, to Alicia. And um, obviously, uh, thank you to Jonathan for co, co um, running these events with us. Um, and if you've got any feedback for us, please pop it in the chat. We'd like to know if you think there's something else we should follow up with. Um, please let us know and, and anything we can do better, of course. Um, but thank you very much. And it's been a real privilege to be part of this seminar. And thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Take care. Bye.